so Sion, um, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, I think I can um, now uh, let my colleague um, to start this conversation. Hi, Sion. Uh, I, first, I want to talk about uh, the novel. You wrote it in 2003. Uh, luckily, it's come here to Croatia you know, a couple of years later. Uh, but uh, the translation of the, the title of the novel is The Blue Fox. And on, on Croatian, it's the same, Plava Lisica, which sounds nice. You know, it sounds friendly, cuddly. You know, everybody wants to have a blue fox as a pet. But uh, the original title is, you know, Skuga Valdor. It's much meaner. It's a mean, mean creature. So can you tell us? What's the what is this mythic creature and why is it the title of your novel? <clears throat> well, uh, let me begin by thanking you for having me here at Buxa. I heard about Buxa uh, two months ago when uh, Mika uh, Budovic mm -hmm. uh, uh, was in Wales at a meeting where I was, and she told us about this this great spot in. Uh, your city and I thought I have to be there one day and that one day came sooner than I thought so I'm happy to be here uh, yes the title uh, in uh, English and uh, Dutch and uh, Slovenian and many other languages is the blue fox and uh, the reason uh, that this has become the title of the book in so many countries is simply because this was the English title. And in English, uh, the word blue, when it comes to foxes, means dark brown. Mm -hmm. Yes. For some reason, the English fur trade chose to call this particular uh, shade of, of brown on foxes blue. So, the blue fox means the brown fox. Uh, You're cheated. Yes, uh, but uh, in the original, uh, uh, the book is called Skukabaltur, like you said. Skukabaltur is a, a creature from folk, folk uh, stories and uh, folk culture. A creature that is uh, the offspring of a, of a male cat and a female fox. So it is a, a, a hybrid animal that is born in the wild, but has the features of a cat and it is like a giant cat in a way. And these creatures were very much feared, they were very fierce, they, they killed sheep and uh, they could attack people. And uh, I think the reason they were so much feared was simply that, uh, uh, that they were monsters, but they could uh, pass as domestic animals or pets, or I don't know, cat, cats are of, of course not pets in those days. They were there to catch the mice, you know, otherwise they were hanged. Uh, so, but anyway, it could cross the border between the wild and, and, and the human habitat. But then also the, 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 the title Skuka uh, refers to the fact that this has also become a term in Icelandic for shady man, uh, for evil man. And one of the main characters in the book is called Baltur Skukkason, so his name is is uh, a twist on the name of the creature and uh, if you read the book then you can decide for yourself if he has the nature of that creature or not. Excellent. Uh, without uh, talking too much about the plot, uh, uh, this, this link between the wilderness and the, the human domestic uh, is very much uh, problematized in your novel. You know, it reminds me of the Hemingway's Old Man and the Sea, but it's more like you know, evil old man and the uh, ice sea. So uh, what is uh, in your novel a uh, relation between uh, the human and the nature? Yes, uh, but let's tell people that the novel takes place in the 19th century. It takes uh, uh, place in, uh, in a remote valley uh, 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 in Iceland in the 19th century, the, the, uh, in the, let's say, the, the, uh, in, the, in the eighth decade of the 19th century and has as its main characters this Baltur Skukason, who is a priest or a reverend and a fox hunter, uh, Friedrich Bia Friedjonsson, who is a botanist and a lover of French poetry and a former uh, opium smoker, and uh, a young woman with Down syndrome, and a tricky vixen, a tricky female fox. 
so, what was the question again? Uh, what's the relation between the, the human yes, and the nature? Yes, yes, yes. Obviously, uh, 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 they live on the on the on the edge, let's say, of the possible human habitat. This is a very dark valley, small, narrow valley. Uh, in the spring, uh, the glacial uh, melting water floods the valley, so uh, so so they are really, in a way, at the mercy of the elements. But in the book, uh, the the, uh, the the priest, the reverend, Walter, goes into the wilderness because of his greed. He goes into the wilderness, and in a way, it is uh, a depiction of. Uh, man's arrogance when it comes to the powers of nature. He thinks that he can just go into into the glacial fields and uh, do whatever he wants there. But of course, nature is bigger than even a priest. <laughs> I have a question. Another interesting uh, things about the book is that you, especially when we talk about uh, literature and music. Uh, which will be the topic tonight, uh, I assume a lot, uh, is that you compared the structure, the composition of a book, of this book, with the classical string quartet. So, Luca and I don't know much about uh, classical music. Um, so, can you explain it a little bit? Why is this novel musical? Well, uh, well, uh, I like to work with uh, structure and form in everything I do. Maybe it comes from the fact that I started as a poet, and uh, when you are a poet working in the, let's say, modernist, surrealist tradition, uh, each poem seeks its own form and becomes its own piece of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, yes, a literary structure. So, for a long time I have, I have been interested in working with different forms. And of course I started, uh, like so many people, I started uh, becoming aware of the lyrical possibilities of language through music. I was a, a hopeless David Bowie fan when I was a teenager. I completely uh, wallpapered my room with photographs of that man and uh, listened to everything he did and read every lyrics every interview, and I think it was in his lyrics that I became aware of the possibilities of language, that you could do very strange things. And of course those were songs. Uh, but in this book, uh, uh, what happened with this book is that I had, all, uh, I had uh, written the first part, which is the books, we can, we can tell, them, tell people here that the book starts with a hand. It's quite obvious because it starts with a hand. Uh, uh, and uh, and I had written this first part, and I didn't know more or less what I was going to do next. I had this first part, and I knew that this would somehow lead to a story. This would become a story one day. But uh, 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 in the meantime, while I put this aside, and until I came back to it, I worked with the Brodsky Quartet, which is a well-known uh, English uh, string quartet. Uh, I got to know them because they had worked with uh, Björk on, uh, on the post album, her second album. And uh, I interviewed them uh, uh, for a book that was written about that album. So that's how I got to know them. And one day they called me and asked me to do a project with them. While I was preparing for the project, uh, I uh, listened to all the string quartets that they had recorded. And they had recorded more or less all of the great classical string quartets. So I did my work with them, I came back, took up, the, took up this chapter, started looking at it, and all of a sudden I realized that there was so much musicality in the movement of the man and the animal, that, there, that it had a musical quality, and I thought, well, if I continue with this now, this will probably take the form of a classical string quartet. And a classical string quartet is in four parts. There is usually one theme or one element that infuses that string quartet, but uh, the four parts are like four movements. Each movement has its own uh, uh, own uh, complexity and 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, speed, and, and uh, but all leads leads to 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 the same 
leads to the same, uh, let's say, emotional uh, truth. So this book is in four parts. Each part has a different complexity. Each part has a different color. But they all belong to this book. So that is the music. And it was very interesting for me. When, I, when, when the book was published in Iceland, the first people who came to me and said, oh, I read your book. Mm, yes, it's a fine book, of course, they said that. Uh, but then they said, uh, there is something musical about it. And why was it strange for me that these people said it to me? It was because they were composers. So they somehow felt, felt and, uh, and, and, and sensed the musical structure in the book. So it is a string project. Great. So uh, it's very rhythmical. <laughs> the book is very rhythmical, but it's also what's, uh, what's I think uh, it might be uh, characteristic for your writing is that uh, you have some realistic situation, but suddenly fantastic elements start to arrive. You know, uh, animals start to talk, people start to become animals. Uh, something very you know unusual, unnatural occurs, but it feels natural. So, you, do you believe that uh, this kind of fan fantasy? And magic is, uh, you know, an uh, integral part of a uh, reality or a perception of a reality. Well, uh, what I can say is that uh, all the all the all the fantastical elements in the book are absolutely rooted in reality, mm -hmm. and uh, when they happen, they are a part of a particular person's perception of what is going on. And uh, I can say that on the personal level, uh, that I always believe people when they tell me that they have had strange things happening to them. If somebody comes to me and says, well, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I was in Iceland and uh, I, I went to this small guest house on the south coast and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and, uh, and uh, I got out of my bed and into the corridor because I heard a sound and then a ghost came and kissed me. <laughs> there was a woman that told me this recently. And uh, I have it as a rule to believe people when they tell me such things. Because why would she be making this up or, or, or telling me this if it hadn't happened to her? So it really happened to her. And I believe her. So, uh, and I think uh, literature is a place where uh, those things can happen, and they can happen realistically. Uh, all literature comes from trying to understand what reality is. And all literature works on the borders of reality. Simply by starting to read a story, you are halfway in the story and halfway in your reality. So we are already metamorphosing when we start reading. Uh, okay, so um, it's somehow um, connected to this. Um, in, in, your, um, in your novels, you refer to mythology and to folk stories, Icelandic. Um, and it's actually um, quite connected to what you said. Um, can mythology and uh, can folk stories um, still be relevant for interpretation of um, of a contemporary uh, world around us? Can they can they help to explain it? I think uh, 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 it is good to uh, believe that folk stories have never stopped happening because the folk stories that have come down to us. They didn't just take place like in few years in the 19th century. They are uh, stories about things that have happened to the human being over many centuries and even over thousands of years. And why, why, why would folk stories have stopped happening? I don't know. Sto folk stories are still happening. There are still all sorts of things happening which are maybe not like this uh, experience uh, I, I just told you about from the guest house in Southern. Iceland. If you ask me nicely afterwards, I can tell you which guest house you want to have this experience. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we are always uh, we are always uh, reading folk stories in the newspapers, uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, there are always folk stories happening. 
And we do not see them as folk stories today because we are the contemporaries of those folk stories. Uh, one element of folk stories is, uh, let's say, let's take one element of a folk story, which is a curse. Somebody does something and there will be a curse on that family for a long time. We all know families who have had incredibly bad luck in their lives. And sometimes you get the feeling that, what is going on with this family? At what point did this family go on this track that people are dying left and right, people are going to jail left and right? You know, there is something that happened to this family at a certain point. So this is, in a way, close to the elements of the folk story. So that's why I think old folk stories uh, can be can be uh, can be a good tool to understand that we are always living in a folk story. Mm -hmm. Uh, you already mentioned, um, besides folk stories, you already mentioned uh, both David Bowie and uh, um, surrealism, actually. And um, if I got it uh, right, you you say uh, when people ask you about you as a reader and your beginnings, you say that you started as a kid or a teenager, um, started reading uh, folk stories, started to start, then started reading poetry, surrealist poetry, then started listening to uh, popular music and punk. So, um, and you somehow compare it often. So what I'm interested in is, what is, uh, what is the connection between surrealism and punk and folk stories? And um, what, what is the connection so that a um, uh, kid, a reader, uh, should be interested at the same time in surrealism, in folk stories, and in punk? Well, uh, I don't know why I was interested in all those things as a first as a kid and then as a teenager, and uh, I, I, I simply uh, just keep throughout my life being excited about strange things. Uh, uh, yes, when I was, when I was uh, eight years old, I was living uh, with my grandmother. My mother and I, we, we lived with her for three years. And uh, one day when I had finished all the books that I had uh, brought home from the library, uh, I uh, looked at the bookshelves of my grandmother's library. Uh, we have, have a, a fine tradition in Iceland of home libraries. So my grandmother had a good, good collection. And uh, there was a wonderful uh, edition of Icelandic folk stories. I started reading this and I discovered that uh, even the strangest, uh, strangest, uh, 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 strangest uh, boy detective novels that I had been reading, uh, and the most exciting ones, they were nothing compared with the Icelandic folk stories. Because in the Icelandic folk stories, there were crazy things. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we really do not have ghosts in Icelandic folk stories. So I guess this ghost on the south coast of Iceland was somebody that came from a building in the same uh, village, which is called the House, and there was a Danish family who lived there. So it was probably the ghost of a Danish person who was kissing, is kissing women there. Uh, uh, but uh, for example, uh, when the dead uh, reappear in Iceland, they are always they, they always rise from the graves, you know. I mean, they come there like uh, with everything. So they are like zombies. Uh, and we have monsters and lakes and rivers and, 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 and the sea. We have people disappearing into the ground and, and returning absolutely mad after an encounter with, uh, with beautiful women that live in stones. And I was eight years old, and the beautiful thing about it was that this was absolutely crazy, very exciting, very scary, and it had all happened in Iceland. So I thought, wow, these things have been happening here. And uh, I think those little uh, boy detective novels are exciting. So when I became interested in surrealism, I, re I, I really from the beginning realized that there was a, there was a threat. Because uh, both uh, surrealism and folk stories are uh, ways of trying to understand the complexity of our lives uh, through telling or, 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 or doing something with, 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 with words. And then David Bowie, he was strange. He was strange. And he said, you should be strange. That's the only way to be. We should all be strange. And he gave us all a license to be strange. Uh, then punk happened. And punk gave us all the license to just do whatever we wanted. 
You didn't have, a, have to have a talent, you just had to do. That was the message of the Icelandic punk wave anyway. It was, uh, it's not a matter of what you can, but what you do. Uh, uh, so the punk movement gave us uh, courage just to start uh, publishing our own books, releasing our music, you know. So, yeah, that's, that's how it's been. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so somehow the motto has always been the stranger, the crazier, the more rebellious, the better, you know. Because, you know, nobody wants to live in a stagnant water, you know. We need, uh, we need, we need to move around. We need to, yeah, keep things moving. Yeah, when we, when we talk about things moving, I have a tough question, so you know. Okay. And uh, it's a tough question because, uh, well, almost none of us know Icelandic language, so we can't really know uh, how it uh, sounds in, in originally, but uh, when we talk about surrealism, we do know that Icelandic is a closed language because of the, you know, it's culturally uh, distant from the Europe and it also has a you know, strict uh, language policy. So how does your surrealism function in Icelandic? You know, how do you play with, with words? Well, uh, surrealism is a tool, it's a wonderful tool to, to, to work with in language. And uh, it doesn't matter what language it is, you know. You can, uh, uh, even in a much uh, more isolated uh, non-European language like Green the Greenlandic, uh, the, the, the Inuit language, you can write surrealism. Surrealism is a state of mind. You just work with what you've got. The names of things, you know, that is what you use in surrealism. Uh, so it was no problem to write surrealist poetry in, in, in Icelandic. And actually, in Iceland, the Icelandic language has a wonderful possibility of, of uh, uh, creating new words through combining existing words, you know. So I can easily, I can <coughs> easily, I mean, for example, staples in Icelandic uh, are hesthus. Mm -hmm. Hester means horse and hus means house, so it's horse house, you know. <laughs> but hestus, yeah, that is that is that is a staple. Uh, Eltus is a kitchen. It's the it's a house of fire, the house where fire is kept. Uh, so it's a wonderful language for surrealism, and surrealism is just uh, yeah, just what you need when you need to break up the language. You need to break up your your uh, habit of thinking. And uh, if you need to break up the tradition of a society, and if you need to break up uh, the structure of a society, surrealism is the best tool. With a little bit of anarchism, perfect. Uh, so, um, uh, you, you were a punker, you were a surrealist, but your first book, uh, you, you self-published it when you were 15, which was a book of poetry. So, uh, you know, if in Croatia a teenager self-published a book, he wouldn't be the most popular kid in, in school, you know. He, you know, everybody would, would make fun of him. So, you know, was it normal in Iceland? How was it? Uh, no, of course it is not normal. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but uh, it was, uh, but it was, uh, you know, let's say everybody was very kind, you know. Both the grown-ups and the kids, you know. It was like, oh, so. He's just published a book of poetry. Okay, <laughs> little bit strange, but nobody was negative. Nobody said anything bad about it. The feeling was more like, okay, if that's what he wants to try, you know, let him try. Uh, nothing bad will come of it, you know. He will maybe, maybe, maybe he will write another one and then start, <laughs> and then he will be very embarrassed later on when his kids find those books and show them to him and say, did you do that? No, 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 don't do this. So, but, so, so the, in, in Iceland, the, uh, in general, the feeling is that everybody is, has the right to call himself or herself an author and just start writing and publishing. In the, in the late 60s and, of course, into the 70s, uh, self-publishing uh, became in Iceland the, 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 the main way for young poets to, to step forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can uh, say that uh, most, most successful, uh, respected authors of my generation 
started in this way. And it started even earlier. Uh, Halter Lastness, the Nobel Prize winner from 1955, he published his first book at the age of 17, a little bit old, I think, because I was 15, but he was 17. He published his first book himself, and he got the Nobel Prize. So in Iceland, if, you, if you're going to argue against uh, self-publishing, then we say, well, if it's good enough for a Nobel Prize winner, why not look at what this kid is doing? He started as a poet, um, and um, and you, you wrote uh, a lot of poetry, but you also written um, some texts for musicians. Um, we, uh, we know about Bjork. Uh, so now let's switch maybe to this subject a little bit. You, uh, your collaboration with Bjork has started uh, actually when you were uh, still teenagers, I, as we found. Uh, it started in a um, uh, rockabilly duo, uh, Roca Roca Drum or Drum. I don't know where she played drums. If I'm if I'm not wrong, or or maybe I'm wrong. And you were the vocal. Then uh, also Ben Sugar Cubes. Then later, of course, um, working um, writing texts for for some of her songs. Um, also collaborating with Moby and so on. So uh, just for the beginning, can you tell us? Uh, how did you two meet, and how did it be, uh, uh, begin? It began actually two years before the Rockabilly Band. Uh, it started in, uh, we met in, two, in uh, 1981. Uh, uh, I was in a small group of surrealists called Medusa. It was actually uh, a surrealist movement of seven, and our goal was to change ourselves and change Icelandic society, and we succeeded. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, one of the poets was Thor Elton, uh, who was also my best friend. And uh, when he founded a small, uh, small uh, group called uh, Van Houten's Coco, which was actually one of the first electronic events in Iceland that started mixing synthesizers with, with, with uh, other ordinary or with ordinary rock and roll uh, uh, instruments. Uh, 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 they started playing, uh, playing on Icelandic uh, music scene that started in 1981. And one day he introduced me to his new girlfriend, and that was Björk. <laughs> so that's how we met. And Björk uh, became a part of Medusa, like an unofficial uh, satellite of Medusa, and took part in some of the things we did. So that's how we met. And, uh, and uh, like uh, young people do, we were uh, all of us, you know, more or less, uh, uh, more or less, uh, bringing each other up as as uh, artists and cultural cultural uh, personalities, you know. So uh, when I'm wor working with Björk today, it's it is really for me like, uh, uh, and uh, I hope for her, uh, like a return to the surrealist laboratory of the 80s. And we are just continuing a, continuing a conversation that started in those days. Uh, and it was just like that, you know, when somebody discovered a film or when somebody discovered a book or, or, or new music, it was listened to by everyone and we were like, okay, so this is possible. And we were just like exploring the possibilities of our art and other art. And that is what we built on. So we have a, so 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 the so the advantage we have when we sit down to work together on, on new songs or, or some projects is that we have a, a huge uh, uh, field of reference in common. You know, uh, one of the things that had a big influence us on us uh, in the 80s uh, on the surrealist side was the visual art of the sur of the surrealist women artists. Leonora Carrington, Remedio Varos, Rita Kahlo, who was associated with the surrealist Toyan, the Czech, uh, Czech uh, painter. And this is something that we can always refer to as an example, you know. So that's how we work together. And uh, uh, there was something good that happened there in the 80s. There was a good rebellion, uh, but also, uh, 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 also, also, at the same time, there was a there was a strong uh, sense of rebellion. Uh, we all took our craft as artists very seriously. 
So when that two came, those two things came together, you know, that, that was what worked. Uh, you worked uh, as very young uh, friends, but uh, uh, until today you've made really great, uh, great things, great music, and, um, and great, well, a movie, of course. Um, um, and um, I want so it's not just only uh, this um, big French friendship and understanding. It's obviously uh, your poetics and your media when they meet. They they're really uh, it's a it's a nice crash and really um, productive one. Uh, so I wonder what is it like uh, to write songs, to write texts, lyrics. For for school, um, that will be performed by someone else, uh, especially by such a strong um, artistic personality and a performer as Björk is. Yes, uh, I, uh, I I I didn't start uh, writing lyrics actually until the mid '90s, while Björk asked me to uh, first work on the song Isobel. And after that, we, we continued and wrote, we've written many songs together. Uh, I, I, I separate uh, completely uh, the way I uh, write uh, lyrics and the way I write uh, poetry. For me, poetry is something where I am uh, obviously absolutely in charge. The poem has to work both on the page and when it's read aloud, but it cannot rely on anything else while the lyrics are always a contribution to a bigger, a bigger, uh, bigger, uh, a bigger work of art, which is the song. And the song has uh, instruments, has, has all the qualities of, uh, of, of, of the song that is written, the rhythms and, uh, and, uh, and textures of, of, of strings or whatever, and of course the voice that is delivering, delivering the words. And uh, I... Uh, I actually think the stronger the person uh, that is going to sing uh, what you write, uh, the more uh, excited you become about the possibilities of the words that you're going to going to hear produced by that person. So, if the singer is uh, like in uh, like in this case, Björk, of course I I I know that uh, the things I do, if I do them as well as I can, will become even. I, I, even I, even much greater than uh, than what you can see on the page, and uh, I really enjoy uh, working with musicians. My wife she's a mezzo soprano. Her name is Ausgerald Julius Dottir. She works mostly in contemporary music, and we have done some things together. And uh, she has a very powerful, special special voice, and I love uh, hearing her produce my words as well. So and because something happens. Uh, you can do absolutely different things. Uh, in, a, in a song you can be melodramatic, or in the opera you can be melodramatic, or in the opera you have to be melodramatic even. And in a, in a song you can, have a, you can have words that look simple, very simple, almost simplistic on the page, but become a great truth when they're sung out loud. The great Beatles songs, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on. You, it's difficult to write anything much simpler than that. But it is the absolute truth of anyone who's been in love, yeah, 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 you know, throughout the, throughout the decades. OK, so you had another uh, important collaboration, uh, because you wrote text for the musical uh, by Pontrier, Dancer in the Dark. Uh, so it's very interesting, you know, I wanted to know uh, what, you know, what was your influence on this film? Because on the one side, side it's the musical, so you're obviously very important. But on the other side, you, you are constrained by the screen, uh, by the script, and uh, you know, by the collaboration with such you know, strong uh, directors such as Lars Petrier. So you know, how was it for you? Well, it was Björk that brought me into that project. Lars originally, uh, originally approached her uh, to write the music for the film. And uh, after they had met, he got the idea to uh, ask her to be the main actor and play the main role of, uh, of Selma. Uh, 
and uh, when she realized that she would be going, she would she would be going to be work very closely with him, and that she would not be allowed to write the lyrics because he wanted to have a complete separation between what was her work and what was his work. She could bring the music, but the words belonged to the story and the screenplay. So he wanted a complete separation there. And then she suggested that I would uh, join them as a lyricist and librettist, really, which I did. And again, I like to work with strong personalities. And it was really great to work with Lars. Uh, he uh, he was very kind and very uh, uh, and very generous in our collaboration. The first time we sat down to work, he said, "Sean, uh, I have never written lyrics. Uh, how are we going to do this?" So I set up a little plan how we could do it, how we could work it out, and uh, then we did it my way. Uh, of course, uh, the songs they 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 spring from his story and the characters that he has created. And the first time uh, uh, I read the screenplay. Uh, at this summer house where we did our sessions, uh, I was absolutely, absolutely overcome with emotion because it's a very emotional story. And at the end, you know, like any human being, uh, you know, I had tears in my eyes and, and I had to swallow a lump in my throat and take the screenplay inside and said, well, I mean, this is quite a powerful story. And he said, yes, you think so? And you could see I did see the tear, tear in my eyes, so he knew uh, he had done a good job. And then we started looking for possibilities. You know, he had actually uh, possibilities within the characters for their words. He had chosen the parts where the songs should be sung. And then we started working on it. And it was the first time I uh, worked with uh, words uh, for a song within a dramatic context. And the songs really had to spring from the situation and from inside the person. And that was very interesting for me and really made me want to continue to write librettos and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, move in that direction. And since I have written, I think, four, written, I think, four librettos. But our collaboration was, was, was very good and, uh, and enjoyable. And uh, I was allowed to ask any questions uh, because I needed to understand the deeper workings of the screenplay. And uh, that, of course, became like a masterclass for me, you know, in screenwriting, because he is really, really a master of writing tragedies, as we all know who have cried at his films. I also had some, some tears. Yes, yeah. you so. should. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your first libretto, in a way. Yes, it is my first libretto. And I actually think, in many ways, uh, my, my, uh, my work with Lars uh, had a strong influence on me. Uh, this book, The Blue Fox, is the first book I write after our collaboration. And uh, I think it's more than possible that uh, working with Lars uh, pushed me a little bit in the direction that I took in this book. This was the first book I wrote which uh, had like, let's say, a more open, uh, open and direct ethical or moral, uh, moral dimension. And I think it might have been the work on Selma and uh, Dancing in the Dark that moved me in that direction. So I am easily influenced, and uh, and uh, I enjoy and enjoy uh, 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 learning from from the different uh, projects I go into, and that is why I, I keep doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. I should be writing my own books, but I keep saying yes to all sorts of commissions and projects and. And uh, like the Brodsky Quartet and then, uh, then, uh, then uh, the Dance in the Dark, but I really do it because I believe that it provides me the new tools for the writing. Well, we'll help you to return to your own books now, uh, <laughs> because we want to ask a question about uh, your literature, your novels. You, you often say that uh, you're, you're a novelist who occasionally writes poetry. So why is it the form of novel so important to you? I started as a poet and a surrealist poet. And one of the, one of the, one of the uh, dogmas of surrealism is that the novel is a hopeless, hopeless literary form. Andre Breton uh, really uh, made fun of the novel as a form and said no uh, writer with, uh, re with self, uh, any self, uh, with a self-respect 
uh, writes novels. Who wants to read descriptions of furniture and the weather? <laughs> Said something like that. And, uh, and uh, I was like, yes, yes, I'm never going to write a novel. I will always be a poet because that is the perfect literary art. But then I read a book which completely changed, changed that. And that was The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, uh, which I read, I think, when I was 18 or 19. And it absolutely blew my mind and uh, showed me that everything can happen between the covers of a great novel. And in that novel, as you know, who have read it, you have a love story, you have a, you have a horror story, you have pure comedy, you have de the devil and you have a, have a Christ or Messias figure. Everything finds place in that amazing novel. So I think that pushed me <laughs> in the direction of, of, of trying to write a novel uh, in 1987. Uh, I had become a little bit tired of writing poetry because the poet is always at the center of the poem. The poem is in a way the world filtered through, through, uh, through the mind of, 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 of a poet. So yeah, so I decided to try novels. But you know, I, if I have said that I'm a novelist who occasionally writes poetry or poems, uh, it can also be said that uh, I am a poet who finds it very hard to write poetry. So between the few poems that I managed to write, uh, I write novels because it's easier. <laughs> who is your favorite character, Voland or Master or...? It is Korovyev. Korovyev. Yes, the, the choir master, yes. Yes, but, uh, but you know, then when I started uh, writing novels, I discovered, of course, the many possibilities uh, of the novel. And I enjoy working with story, I enjoy, enjoy working with characters. And in my case, I enjoy working with historical settings because they give me a possi the possibility of writing stories that also have the quality of the fables because they take place in the past. They take you to a world that is real but has different rules, in a way, than our world. So it's a good tool to reflect on many burning issues uh, that uh, uh, exist in our uh, contemporary lives. Uh, okay, uh, I just want to ask you uh, one or two questions about your latest novel that hasn't been translated to creation uh, yet. still yet. Yeah. Uh, we hope it will be, um, and then maybe we can open the floor for Q and A. So if anyone has questions, you can maybe now prepare them and make them be good. Um, your latest novel, uh, its title is Moonstone, the boy, the boy who never was, uh, and you can, you can. It was published, I believe, in 2013 or something like that. Um, Maybe you can tell us more about it and uh, what I know about it. Uh, not that much, but what I know about it is that there is um, also this um, um, queer dimension, queer topic, uh, actually a queer character. Um, so, um, but but that you also said that you didn't want only to uh, incorporate a queer topic, but also to write in a queer style. So, can you just tell us a little bit more about the book? And what do you mean by um, writing in a queer style? Or I don't, I'm not sure I have ever said that I, I, I was Luka told me that. wrote it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a queer style. Who said it? Luka. Really? Where, where did I say it? OK. Uh, if I said it, uh, maybe I'll try to explain it. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, one, one of the one of the one of the things I think uh, all of my novels have have in common, and uh, this what uh, the Blue Fox has in common with the Moonstone, uh, is that uh, I like to work with people who somehow have been pushed to the edge of society, are not accepted by society, and in a way by their very existence become a test for society, test for the humanity and compassion of the society they are born into. In this case, it is this young woman with Down syndrome. In, uh, in, the, in, in the Moonstone, it is a young boy who is an orphan, who is dyslexic, uh, who uh, is uh, queer, 
and uh, unemployed. He's a drifter in Reykjavik. He's 16 years old. His only joy in life, you can say, is cinema. Mm -hmm. So he lives for cinema. And uh, apart from that, he's just drifting. To make money, uh, he has discovered that uh, he can sell his body to, uh, to uh, the closeted uh, man of Reykjavik in 1918. This takes place quite some time ago uh, in a society that was, of course, uh, very closed, very, very unforgiving uh, when it came to came to came to uh, queer issues or, or homosexuality, as they even didn't call it then, because in those days people didn't even have words for what this was, apart from it being unclean and uh, disgusting. So this kid, he is, uh, he's the main character of this book. And the reason uh, uh, he becomes a very powerful character, he's, the, he's, he's a very, he's one of the small individuals. He's one of the small, weak, powerless individuals of society. But the reason he becomes a very strong character in this book is uh, because uh, in, the, in, 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 in the autumn of 1918, uh, many things happened in the small Icelandic society of Reykjavik, a Reykjavik of 15,000 people. The volcano Katla started erupting in the middle of October, clouding the sky, raining us over Reykjavik. In the beginning of November, the Spanish flu came to Reykjavik and started, uh, started devastating the city population. Uh, out of 15,000 people, 10,000 people fell horribly ill. 500 people died over the span of, of, of a few weeks. And on the 1st of December, Iceland became an independent country. So I needed a very special character to tell that story and take us to that place in time. And that character became a mountain this young kid who is surviving and is not a victim. He is a strong character who somehow just is what he is. And this book, uh, like you said, came out in 2013 in Iceland. And for a strange reason, well, let's say uh, a strange reason, I don't know. Yes, <laughs> for some strange reasons, it became the most, most successful book in, uh, in, uh, in Iceland. And it got every literature award, award in Iceland, uh, apart from the Women's Literature Prize. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow, I feel that was unfair. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, it is my most successful uh, novel in, in, in Iceland, and uh, so it tells me that you can never calculate what works when you are uh, works uh, in, in literature. You can never decide this is what works if I'm going to write a bestseller, because I was working with the Spanish influenza, silent cinema, and homosexuality with a little bit of leprosy thrown into the mix. <laughs> and uh, that was the formula for a bestseller in Reykjavik in 2013. So it's my success most successful book after this one. This one, uh, of course, uh, has become a classic in, in, in Iceland. It's read in the university and high schools and everywhere. And uh, Moonstone is like, uh, I was always, uh, no, I was not always trying, I, because I simply write what I need to write. But uh, it is strange to have a very successful book like this one, which has been published in 30 languages and won prizes. It's very difficult to have a book like this, this because everybody feels it's your best book. And then you keep writing, saying, no, my new book is my best book. Uh, but the Moonstone is like, you know, the first time that I really hear people say, no, no now you've even written a better book, so that was good for me. And it was good for, 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 for that book to become so successful because we have almost no history of uh, gay characters in Icelandic fiction. So it was also a big moment for, for, many, for many, many, many queer people in Iceland to finally have a book that told their untold and hidden story. Uh, okay, oh, so actually now you almost answered my final question which was actually the, um, like um, did this um, queer character and the topic beside making 
uh, a material for a really good and successful book. Was it was your intention to um, also to steer a political debate? So uh, maybe it's more uh, the result of the fact that uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, LGTB movement in, in Iceland has had an, an, an amazing success in the last uh, last decade. They started in 1978 and uh, and uh, slowly but surely started working on one side through the legislation on the other side through education and all of a sudden around uh, around 98 after 20 years of very careful and uh, and uh, clever i think uh, campaigning they won the nation on their side almost overnight so when the first uh, voting went through the parliament on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 on equal human rights for this uh, part of our citizens. It went through the parliament uh, with, with uh, 62 votes against one. There was only one member of parliament who voted against it. And uh, it was okay because we all knew that he strains anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So it's more like a result of that, I would say. I followed the history of uh, history uh, more or less from 78, because through David Bowie, all of a sudden, all those questions about gender, sexuality, they were up in the air. He put the questions in front of us. And even though uh, we know that uh, later, uh, you know, he's been, uh, he's been accused of appropriating, you know, uh, Appropriating his, uh, his his gay role and uh, or, or appropriating the lives of, 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 of real gay people and all that it doesn't matter because he put the questions out there for all of us. So I followed this from very early on and uh, of course experienced my friends in school coming out and, and having some of them very troubled lives, some of them taking their lives and all those tragedies, but also the victories. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we were we are extremely glad that uh, Sion decided to come to Buxa. So I urge you to, to read the Blue Fox, read Sion, uh, read it in any language you know or don't know. And if you meet any teenagers, encourage them to read uh, the right surrealist poetry uh, and, and, give Sion, and give Sion a warm applause, please. Thank you.